Um, welcome to our Value Investing Masterclass. I'm Valerie Arnold, co-head of North American Distribution at Pazina Investment Management. I'm delighted to introduce you to our moderator, Steve Galbraith. I'm fortunate enough to have met Steve in the late 90s when he briefly worked with us at Pazina Investment Management. Steve met Rich prior to this when they both worked together at Sanford Bernstein. Steve has a very accomplished career, serving as the Chief Investment Officer and Chief U.S. Strategist at Morgan Stanley, where he was the top-ranked investment strategist on Wall Street in the investor, in the institutional investor pool. Steve was also a partner at Maverick Capital, where he chaired the firm's advisory committee. Today, he's a managing member of Kindred Capital. For 10 years, Steve served as an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School, where he taught security analysis, and today, Steve chairs the board of directors of Success Academy and serves on the board of his alma mater, Tufts University, and on the board of our firm, Pazina Investment Management. Please welcome Steve Galbraith. Thanks, Valerie. And welcome, everyone, this afternoon. Uh, we'll try and keep this relatively informal. The, the format will be I'll pepper Rich and Joel with questions for, say, 35 minutes or so, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions as well. As Valerie mentioned, I've known Rich basically my whole investment career. In fact, I interviewed with him at Sanford Bernstein, and I still remember one of the first analytic questions he asked me, which was, there are two college basketball teams playing. One is ahead at the half. What are the probabilities that that team wins? And despite really pathetic answers to the question, I, he, he still hired me. Um, and, and please feel free to distribute your answers to that question to your investment relations folks at both Pazina and Gotham, because it's an interesting answer. Um, through Rich, I was fortunate enough to get to know Joel. And as Valerie mentioned, we sit on various boards together, including the board of Pazina. We've done philanthropic things together and, and we know each other's families. So this really is an all in the family event. And we also all have, as many value investors do, we have a common link to Columbia Business School. I was an adjunct there for a decade, and, and one of my students actually now works for Warren Buffett. Uh, and, and keen judge of talent I am, I think I gave him a C in the class. Um, Rich worked, uh, also taught at Columbia, I think for a year or two. And Joel, as best I can tell, is the longest tenured, non-tenured professor in the history of Columbia. And so there is the link to a university tie, which brings me my segue to these two guys who really are masters in the value investing world. They actually met in college. And I thought it might be nice to set the stage, Rich and Joel, if you could maybe just give them, the audience, a, a few minutes on how you met and, and showing a, a fierce precociousness. You actually worked on something as college undergrads, I think, or maybe MBAs that got published in the Journal of Portfolio Management, which I think it, to this day may be a first and a last. But if you could maybe just uh, let folks know how you met each other and we'll take it from there. Want to start, Joel? Um, okay. Uh, well, I knew Rich a little bit in school and we got into a five-year program uh, to be undergrad and grad, you know, to finish everything in five years. And so, uh, we spent uh, a good time together in school. Um, I was actually studying for the law boards. Uh, unfortunately, I did end up going to one year of law school after uh, graduate business school, but I wised up uh, uh, that I didn't want to be a lawyer. I guess I just wanted to avoid working. But when I was studying for the law boards, I happened to read an article in Forbes about Ben Graham's stock picking formula. And everything I had been learning in school was that, you know, this stuff doesn't work. And it doesn't uh, make any sense to try to beat the market. It was all efficient markets. And a light bulb went off and saying, this totally makes sense. You know, I showed it to my friend, Rich Pazina, who's, uh, you know, sitting virtually next to me right now. And uh, we uh, thought about it and said, this is unbelievable. We should, you know, update this and, and see if it works. And, uh, you know, we collaborated together with a friend of ours, Bruce Newberg, and, uh, uh, you know, Rich was our computer expert, and at that time, uh, a computer meant, uh, you know, a something that was three rooms big, one computer, and you had punch cards, and uh, Rich knew how to navigate that, and I don't know, you can finish the story, Rich, but uh, it was a big process. Well, the story wasn't as, as exciting as it might sound with computers, because there was no data on any of the computers, so 
in order to recreate Ben Graham's work, um, we had to go manually through stock guides and it was impossible to do by hand. So we decided that if we did the letter, stocks would start with the letter A and B, we would have a fairly representative sample. And that's what we did. We, and, and that study, which was basically that if you buy stocks that are selling below the net net working capital on their balance sheets and not losing money, you can make a lot of money. And guess what? It still worked 50 years later. Um, and while it's almost impossible today to find anything that sells below net net working capital, and by the way, net net working capital means net working capital minus all debt. So you you could see what was cheap um, back then, but the concept of what is cheap, um, I think, has resonated and remains part of the DNA of both Joel and and I for our whole careers. I still so believe though with the so stacks of. Uh of Standard & Poor's stock guides that we went through. I, I remember sitting in the library with stacks and stacks of, of those Standard & Poor's stock guides. And uh, it was a pretty daunting task, uh, nevertheless, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So <clears throat> the world's changed a, a fair amount I, since then. And, and one of the things that did become clear from disciples of Graham is an evolutionary approach to the way they think about value. So if you reflect back, you know, Buffett, his original stuff with Berkshire Hathaway was very much cigar butt investing. And I think folks would like to get a sense for how your views of value have evolved. I know, Joe, Joel, you really started as almost a special situations, concentrated value guy, and clearly are on a diff slightly different platform these days. And Rich, maybe if you could talk how your thoughts of value investing have evolved from that point. Maybe Joel, if you could start. Oh, sure. Well, a big picture. I, I started um, uh, looking at special situations because I was in the risk arbitrage business as my first job uh, after dropping out of law school. And that was a little bit the opposite of Ben Graham. You know, it's, uh, you know, buying companies at, uh, you know, full price. Uh, and I, I basically hated the business. Uh, you know, it was sort of make a dollar or lose 20 you know, if you were wrong and, you know, up one, down 20, didn't just never appeal to me as a risk reward. And so I was always looking for ways to get out of the risk arbitrage business. So I was looking around the corners at uh, various special situations and, uh, uh, you know, uh, interesting uh, securities that fell off the back of mergers or stub stocks or companies that are being recapitalized, anything that was a little bit complicated. But really, my basis in value investing still applied. You still had to value everything. It's just that you found things off the beaten path. And then I evolved more into just uh, buying uh, cheap things, but really became Buffettized in that, you know, uh, you know, Ben Graham said, figure out what it's worth, pay a lot less, leave that large margin of safety. And that was, you know, always the basis of what we do. Uh, Buffett said, well, if you can buy a good business cheap, even better. And so there are certain qualities that Buffett's very clear about uh, that make a, a, for a good long-term business. And so we incorporated both those thoughts. And uh, I ended up uh, actually just, you know, you were talking about the uh, Ben Graham paper we did in college together. Uh, I actually was so intrigued by, you know, what I had been teaching my students for many years, what we had used to make money at Gotham for so many years in the early 2000s. I actually went back and, and tried to do a study showing that, you know, Buffett's concept of good and cheap also worked. And the very first test we ran, I ended up writing a book called The Little Book That Beats the Market About. And so we didn't spin the computer thousands of times. We said, let's use a crude database. Let's use crude metrics for cheap and good. Does that still work? Just like we did in the, uh, you know, in business school together. And uh, lo and behold, it worked incredibly well, you know, that, and, and what I wrote up was the very first thing we tested. It wasn't a matter of spinning the computer thousands of time to find formulas that worked and, uh, you know, set us off in a, a more diversified way of uh, taking advantage of our uh, how you And Rich, one of the things as a board member of your company and as someone who's in the industry that I've always admired is, you know, Pazina has broadly stuck to its knitting. In other words, we were joking, I think, at a board meeting a couple of board meetings ago that 
we could literally roll out almost the same presentation from when you started. Um, but there has been some nuance to your approach, particularly on the risk management side out of 2007, 2008. So maybe give folks a, a change for some of the you know, evolutionary changes that have taken place at, at your shop. Yeah, well, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back even a little further than that because it took me a little longer to evolve on the quality metric than it did Joel. He's just a faster study than I am. Um, and, you know, I was at Sanford Bernstein where I was still steeped in this idea that whatever you can buy that's cheap, you should buy, um, which is sort of the original work we did. We didn't, on our paper back in college, we didn't think about quality metrics. Um, and I had, uh, been at Bernstein for 10 years, and Joel said to me, why don't you try and look back at that 10-year record? I don't know if you remember this, Joel, but yeah. look back at that 10-year record and, and veto the one-third of the stocks that had the lowest long-term ROE. And I argued it's not going to make any difference because cheap is cheap. And when I did the work, I, my jaw dropped open. Um, and since then I've come to appreciate, maybe um, I recognize that you can't buy the highest quality stocks using traditional metrics at cheap, at, at cheap valuations. But um, if you eliminate the lowest quality, you can certainly add a lot of value to a value philosophy. So I would say that was my fir first big lesson and, and evolution in value investing. The, the, the second for me, and there are two, only two substantive ones, it, it is excess financial leverage and um, value investing are not good bedfellows. Um, because if you have companies that have, have historically done well and find themselves in a situation where something has gone wrong, but they're facing a big debt burden, you've effectively changed the dynamic of what you're doing from investing to gambling, because you have no idea how the principles are gonna behave um, when faced with the stresses of excess financial leverage. And we've we watched it happen. I've made some mistakes, which is how you watch it happen. You see great businesses and they're selling for low prices and you buy them and the banks foreclose because they were short-sighted. Um, and, and the first one that hit me, which was going back into the 90s, which was Fruit of the Loom, actually wound up in Warren Buffett's portfolio out of bankruptcy. So the point is you, you have to um, be very, very careful about the balance sheets. And, that, and, and I think we've tried to systematically um, eliminate any of those risks from our portfolios. That's helpful. So one of the things you hear often in, in investment circles is value investing is dead because book value is irrelevant or X is irrelevant or Y is irrelevant or uh, failure rates are higher, disruptions higher. How do you two think about or how do you prosecute a value strategy? What is value to you? in your dynamic of investing? Well, maybe let me take this one first, Joel. Um, val value is not low price to book. Low price to book is a factor. Value is a philosophy. And when you, when you mix up those two, you're not a value investor. You're executing some kind of factor-based quantitative model. Um, Value can't be dead because what value is, is buying something for less than it's worth. It's just not a possibility that it can be dead. Um, and, and, you know, when you look back at the last decade, which everybody would define as an anti-value decade, well, it actually was a normal value decade. If you look at the returns that you would have achieved as a value investor in the last decade, they would have been comparable to the returns you would have achieved the prior decade and the decade before that. What was different the last decade is that growth went nuts. And, it, and, 
And one of the most amazing um, pieces of data that I've seen is, and, and, and I know this is going to go and sound statistical, even though that, that's not my intent, but if you just took the cheapest stocks over the last 70 years and compared them to the most expensive stocks, you would see something quite fascinating. The multiple that you have to pay for the cheapest stocks has remained the same for 70 years. And the multiple that you have to pay for the most expensive stocks has effectively tripled over that same period. Of Is time. that just interest rates, Rich, or what's driving that? Almost all interest rates, because when you look at it, it dates back to 1980. So the first 25, 30 years of that, you didn't see any difference. And then, and then we had you know, 40 years of interest rates declining, and I think that explains it. And Joel, how, do, how does Gotham think about value? I know, I know the little blue book that beats the market, but maybe none, flesh it out a little more. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that was just more of an illustration. It's not actually what we do, but it shows, you know, the, the opportunity there with just some simple uh, metrics. But, you know, it's hard to say better than rich, but just to put a little color on it as far as what are factors and what is value investing. Uh, value investing is uh, valuing a business like your private equity firm buying the whole business. And what they care about is uh, cash flows and future cash flows and what are the risks of, you know, receiving them down the road and what are you paying for them? And, that, and, and that's very straightforward. The reason factors have worked well, whether they're low price book or low price sales, other than the last you know, uh, decade or so, is that when you buy, a, most likely they work, not because they make a lot of sense, but when you buy a group of companies uh, that are low price book, let's say selling close to their historic cost of their assets, you know, you're not paying much for the business, you tend to get more than your fair share of companies that are out of favor. OK, so it correlates, I would say, with getting more than your fair share of things that are out of favor that may may have an opportunity. Same look, I can't argue that momentum hasn't worked for the last 30, 40 years, not just in this country, but across the globe with one or two exceptions. But let's say momentum didn't work for the next year or two. It could be that it's, you know, a long term factor. It's just cyclically out of favor and uh, you just have to be patient. It'll work again because it works over the long term. Or it could be that, you know, everyone knows a stock use is not so hard to figure out. A stock used to be down here and now it's up here and it's got good momentum and the, the trade is now crowded and it's degraded. And that's why it doesn't work for the next two years because everyone knows about momentum and it's degraded. That's another factor. Um, so that's also something momentum has correlated with good returns in the past. All we care about is causation. So I wouldn't know two years from now if momentum didn't work, whether it was because it's cyclically out of favor or the factor has degraded. And I don't want to know about that. If you really think about stocks as not pieces of paper that bounce around, I mean, I, if I gave you a, you, you know, like, hey, I'm buying all the houses that went up the most in the last three or six months or whatever, you'd say, you know, you're kind of an idiot, you know, uh, as an investment strategy, whether it works over the short term or any period of time. Uh, so with stocks, people sort of lose their bearings a little bit because they bounce around. You can calculate a lot of statistics and a lot of other things, but they're actually ownership shares of businesses, just as Rich saying that you value and try to buy at a discount. And, uh, you know, we're both thinking about buying the whole business as a, like you're a private equity investor. And I don't know a single private equity investor that would go buy a business because it's low price to book or low yeah. price. To book. That's not what they look at. So piggybacking on something you said, Rich, about <clears throat> it really hasn't been a terrible absolute decade for value, but it's been more of a relative terrible period. A lot of feedback I get from investors is they're terrified that you're just going to be in a less bad outcome by buying value today. In other words, if you look at stable valuation metrics of price to enterprise value to sales or market cap to GDP, they're at very high levels. And so is what Pazina is offering today just that your stocks are going to go down less than the market? Or is it, what are your expected return characteristics? I mean, I don't think that's accurate. The, the, the reality is you can buy a host of businesses today that if, you, if we're in the midst of this pandemic, so it, it, it's hard to look at current metrics of earnings and cash flow as being indicative of what's normal. But if you accept 
that you correct to what's normal, meaning economic conditions run, come back to typical economic conditions, there is a vast array of companies that are selling for 10 times or less their normal earnings power, which mm -hmm. means if I never thought anything at all about the market, I didn't, if all I was doing was buying these businesses, I could get a 10% plus expected return. And if you also, if you also believe that these companies, broadly speaking, will grow with nominal GDP long term, you're talking about teens expected return. And so that's what we see. Now, when you compare the when you compare broad economic statistics like enterprise value to economic activity, it's highly, highly skewed by the companies that have have there's giant companies in terms of market cap that have seen their multiples expand broadly, and that's driving that. So I actually think if I was gonna bet what we would earn the next decade or the next, and I'm gonna use decade because any shorter investment period in equities is just idiocy. Um, I would think we would average better than 10% a year from the starting point today. I don't think that's even remotely possible buying the S&P 500. Joel, is your view similar or do you have any nuance to that? Uh, well, a couple, of, I can add a, a little color uh, with some numbers. Uh, you know, to tell you what the froth is in the non-value space, if we, uh, you know, we did some research. So there were 359 companies that lost money in 2019. So that's pre-COVID that now have market caps over a billion dollars. So in other words, if you just bought every single company with a market cap over a billion dollars, 359 of them that lost money in 2019, in 2020, the median return was 65%. The average return was 120%. So that was your single best investment strategy for 20, just buy everything that loses money, which you know generally I've found, and we have a lot of statistics to show that's the world's worst investment strategy. So, but that was the best last year. Uh, another stat that it makes me very hopeful, and it's you know cold in calculating. Uh, we usually can construct a, a value portfolio in our uh, Gotham Large Value Fund. Uh, that has a 50 to 60 percent cash flow premium to the S and P. Uh, today we're off the charts. We can create the same portfolio following the same guidelines with a 95 percent cash flow premium to the S and P. So, uh, and and you, if you look at the chart, it just like blips up. Uh, so, I'm excited. I guess is what I would say about the opportunity set. Uh, what, what I, at least on a relative basis, on an absolute basis, you'd have to tell me where interest rates are going and a number of other, uh, items to let me know. But, uh, you know, we're, we're tasked in our long only portfolios of not telling you how long you should be. We're tasked with saying, Hey, for this portion of the, uh, stocks of, of your portfolio, you want to put in the market. What's the smartest way to do that? And that's the solution we're trying to reach. And that opportunity set is great for us whether it's absolutely cheap. Uh, I think we can get very good returns as Rich was saying from here. Uh, and, and I don't think if you had blinders on, look, this is a very smart way to make money way above the risk free rate. We have that opportunity to do. If someone wants to pay for rides to Mars uh, at a, an astronomical view and, and that strategy beats us, that's really out of my comfort or knowledge zone. And it's possible that it does, but that's not really relevant to me. Uh, I view it as, you know, can you put money to work that makes uh, way above uh, risk free rate return? Uh, is the opportunity set there? Yes. Is it much better uh, uh, versus history, uh, that opportunity set versus the S&P than it's traditionally been? Yes. So both those things are exciting. So one of the things that's right, and I know you guys are both deep fundamentalists at an individual company level, but so much of the setup today seems to me, or it strikes me, is predicated on just uber low interest rates. And that just has such a skewing impact on long duration assets, which some of these really nutty equities are. How do you factor, how do you think about interest rates and their importance in your portfolios today? 
Rich, maybe if you could kick off. I don't really, because I have no idea. Um, it's, you know, uh, to me, investing is about looking at what likely future cash flows are. Um, guessing where interest rates are gonna be is, I use the word guessing because I don't even have a basis for how to think about it. When interest rates are close to zero, it just feels to me like the probability is higher that they're gonna go up than they're gonna go down. But I don't think there's a lot of brilliance in that statement. So if I can create a cash flow stream that I'm reasonably confident is gonna give me a yield or cash, a total return of in excess of 10% a year, I'm mostly indifferent what happens to interest rates. Um, yes, you might value that cash flow stream at a lower rate at some point in the future, but the biggest factor that you, uh, that you mentioned earlier in why the S&P and the growth stocks of the world have, have, have ballooned in valuation out of control, it's not because of low interest rates, it's because of falling interest rates. And so when, because that's what creates the tailwind to valuation. As soon as the interest rates stop falling, all you have is the yield, the cash flow yield of the company. So if Joel's buying stocks at double the cash flow yield of the S&P, and, and, and we are too, and those companies participate broadly in global economic growth, then you are gonna get 10 or 11% a year. Um, and, and if the stock market declines or is volatile in the interim, or maybe things collapse to the point where, where two years from now I could get something that yields better than that, all that might be true. But my options today are to invest in something that can give me 10, something that can give me far less than 10, or buying a treasury, 10-year treasury that gives me one and a half. Those are my and Before I <clears throat> flip it to Joel Rich, Maybe if you could tease out a little bit, you obviously have a large percentage of the portfolio in financials and interest rates do have an operating impact on them. Maybe if you could give folks a view on that well, specific part of your portfolio. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the value of a bank, uh, and I'll use banks primarily for my, my, for my explanation. Um, banks are, the value of a bank is related to their deposit gathering franchises because that's, that's what the franchise is. It's the ability to acquire funds below market. Now, when federal funds are zero, it's extremely difficult for a bank to make any real money. It has to rely on interest rate spreads um, on its loan versus deposit business. But that's not what gives a bank value. What gives a bank value is its, its deposit franchises at below market rates. So. If interest rates go up, and now I'm talking about short-term interest rates, because this is what's going to drive value, franchise value. If interest rates go up to 1%, if Fed funds go up to 1%, then bank earnings, all, other, all else being equal, will go from low teens ROEs to high teens ROEs. And if they go up much above 1%, there's no evidence that they, that they keep that. They then start paying higher deposit rates. So to me, um, bank profitability will rise in a rising interest rate environment. And that is a, a nice hedge against valuation change. And Joel, maybe if I could flip it to you, but broadening the question out, not just interest rates, do you even think about the macro environment in your portfolio construction, or how do you think about the macro environment more broadly when you're looking at your portfolio? Well, one of our assumptions is that uh, when Rich said he didn't know, you know, what was going to happen in the macro environment, I call him to find out what's happening in the macro. Environment. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, big, big picture. Uh, look, uh, you know, just looking at interest rates things get pretty stupid at very low interest rates. You, you, I, I don't pay 100 times earnings for almost any businesses. You know, the, the 359 businesses that lost money, 
There will be, maybe there'll be a few Microsofts, Googles, Amazons, but the vast majority will not be. They're all priced as if they will be the next Amazon, Google, Microsoft. So uh, unlikely that very many will be. So uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the way I tend to think about it is when the risk-free rate is below 6%, I assume the risk-free rate is 6%. Uh, and when I'm buying uh, a business, it has to be uh, comfortably a risk-free rate of 6% adjusted for risk. So, you know, Rich is talking about 10% or more. I mean, we get to the same place, more or less, that uh, bottom line is we're just trying to make money. You know, if we put blinders on and say, look, let's evaluate these investment opportunities. What kind of reasonable return can I get from this? Uh, if we can get a, a risk adjusted and using a very high risk-free rate, a very nice return, uh, what people do with some crazy other stocks uh, that maybe are outside my circle of competence, you know, the, you know, what is the value of, you know, get it, you know, taking a trip to the moon, what will people pay or, you know, Mars, I don't know. And those could do very well, but that doesn't matter to me. I don't, I don't think it's good idea to go dumpster diving in the, the money losers uh, for the few winners, that's typically been the wrong way to go. I'd rather look in a, a pile of companies that, you know, are gushing cash flows, you know, we're able to put together a portfolio with almost double the returns of the S&P with, you know, returns on capital and the businesses of over 60% with uh, big sales growth and, you know, all these other things. And so what else do I need to know? I can put those together now. The market is throwing us these great pitches. We were able to get good returns from here, maybe not relative to some high flyers, you know, because we're in the value space, but really nice risk adjusted returns and, and the opportunity sets even better going forward. And I would say there's froth in some of the other areas. And I'm not talking about Google, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, those are some of the greatest businesses and franchises and networks that I've ever seen. So they may well, and, and we think justify their prices over time, but there are not hundreds of other companies that rhyme with Google, Microsoft and Amazon, and they're all priced as if they will. And that's where I think the froth is. And that's yeah. where our relative and absolute opportunity set comes from, I think. It, it may not have an impact in the market, but a lot of people speak to it. You know, the massive increase in passive investing. So effectively, you know, David Einhorn wrote about this in his letter a little bit, how you have a huge swath of the market now that is valuation agnostic. They're just blindly, you know, blindly buying an index. And then you have other folks that valuation just isn't part of their process. It's it's about TAMs and other stuff that is all Greek to me, but how do you think, how does that factor into today's market? And, and the question, I guess, in a nutshell is, do you see striking parallels to today versus 2000, or is it in fact quite different? Rich? No, I think they're striking parallels. Um, I, it's the, the same phenomenon, which is if, if the things that have, have massive market cap, and I, and this is an interesting statistic because the um, the the Russell 1000 value and the Russell 1000 growth are equal market caps. So to get equal market caps, you have to have so many more stocks by number in the value benchmark than you do in the growth benchmark. So if somebody decides to switch, um, it's very easy to see how the gap narrows because you're taking a lot of money and trying to deploy it in a little space. Um, that's exactly what happened. I mean, when we first started, I'll just tell you the history of Pazina Investment Management, but when we started um, in 96, we soon were in the internet bubble. And from, from the 98, from the fourth quarter of 97 to the first quarter of 2000, we wound up being 6,000 basis points behind the S&P 500 as a new firm. You know, you just sort of say, okay, let's just go home. What's the point of even coming to work anymore? And nine months later, we were ahead of the S&P 500. And that happened with a down 20% on the S&P and an up 40% 
in our portfolio because some of the money that came out of the S&P tried to go into our stocks. That's what happened. So that's what happened in the fourth quarter again, and it's, happen it's happening again this year. Um, I got to tell you, I'll just tell you one, sto one quick story. Um, earlier this week, I got an email from an acquaintance who said, I'm on the board of a $750 million endowment, and we realized we need some more money in value. We're gonna skip all the formalities of having you meet our staff. Can you just come and present to our committee for 20 minutes so we can start up with you on Friday? So I, 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 I thought to myself, wow, it's been 20 years since we got a call like that. Tough one to top, Joel, what do you say? Yeah, no, uh, I, I'll just go with statistics, can't be rich for much else, so. Um... <laughs> I will just say that, uh, you know, I started Gotham Capital in 1985. Uh, we made money every year uh, until 1998, you know, in the internet bubble. And we lost 5%, which was ugly because the market was up 26%. It was a more concentrated portfolio at the time, but still, you know, very value oriented, uh, you know, same philosophy we've always had. 99, uh, market was up another 21 points. We were down five again, second year of losing money. Uh, 2000, and, and by the way, I was teaching at Columbia at that time. I started in 96 and, you know, the kids were more or less chucking erasers at me saying, you don't get it, you know, whatever it is. Uh, in 2000, market was down nine. We were up 114%. Okay. So it wasn't that uh, we were idiots. I, at least I believe we weren't idiots in 98, 99, all, all of a sudden became geniuses in 2000. Uh, in 2000, we just finally got paid for all the work we did in 98 and 99, laying the groundwork, uh, you know, with these great opportunities. And so down five, down five, up 114. It's not a comfortable, you know, in the face of the market going the other way, not a comfortable ride. But, you know, I, I, all last year I was saying, I don't think this rivals, it's not as crazy as the year 2000. But of course, uh, there are certain things that have even happened this year that, you uh, I'm not going to say that. I'll just say there are a lot of crazy things that were happening in parallel then and that are happening now that are maybe uh, at some point, like, you know, if it can't continue, it'll stop. And, and so yeah. I think hopefully we're, uh, you know, getting close. So I've been reminded to ask the audience to send in questions with the Q&A button. They're coming in and I'll hopefully get to them. Um, as you guys know, I'm a trustee at Tufts and I chair the investment committee. And we just went through an unbelievably um, torturous <laughs> process on fossil fuel divestiture and ESG more broadly. And I think historically, I've probably been pretty dismissive of a lot of these efforts, but I can tell you from that seat that it is different in many ways and it probably was 20 years ago. And so I'm no longer as cavalierly uh, dismissing that as part of the investment environment. How do you incorporate ESG broadly into what you do, Joel? If at all, maybe it's just not even a factor. Well, one of the things that we do is look at how we get rated by, uh, by others just coldly, given our process. I mean, obviously, you know, you can, uh, you know, I still believe that, you know, your uh, responsibility is to your, your shareholders. Uh, and if you say it's long-term responsibility, uh, that means uh, you, you don't create value over the long-term by trashing the environment, treating your employees well or, your, or your, your customers badly. That might work out and, and, and doing things from a, from a management standpoint that are short-term incentives that, that go against long-term uh, value to the company. So we're only really looking at companies that do all those things anyway. And so naturally we get rated very well for, uh, from the outside people who look at ESG, but we did set up an ESG specific fund, which used other people's criteria as well that, you know, lo and behold, uh, I think we use, you know, something from Morningstar and Morningstar rates us in our ESG fund even higher, but we have very good ratings in, in both our large value and our ESG fund. Uh, and I think it just comes from the way that you really create long-term value. And if you're doing that 
uh, you know, we're looking at all those things is management uh, treating their shareholders well uh, is, are they creating value for uh, the business? Are they investing well uh, and, and efficiently? And so uh, it, I think it's almost an output of our process rather than an input. Uh, and so uh, we have something that goes even more extreme, uh, but it, it's not a material difference. And uh, so I agree with you, Steve, it's becoming very important to people. And I, I think incorporated in our philosophy, uh, even though I didn't think about it that way, uh, it, it works out to be an output of, of the way we do things. And Rich, if you can answer the same question, and also look, you're the CEO and chairman of a public company, and we do talk about it at the board level, but maybe through the, the lens of both an investor and a chief executive officer. Look, from, from an investor's perspective, even though we five years ago never even knew the words ESG formally, um, we were doing effectively the same thing that we do today focusing on substantive investment issues that determine whether a stock is interesting or not interesting. So if there's an environmental issue, for example, the obvious one is carbon and, and, and owning oil and gas stocks. You can't be rated highly if you own oil and gas stocks on, from third party raters because Carbon is generally just viewed as bad. Um, however, if you're trying to make an investment in an oil company, you'd almost have to be an idiot not to consider the sustainability of their business franchise given what's going on in the world. But I, but I wanna make an interesting point because BP a few months ago and Exxon the other day in their report to their shareholders, BP does an annual energy outlook. They both talked about the aggressive anti-carbon case for oil and gas. And BP said that from now until we don't use hydrocarbons anymore, we have to invest another $20 trillion during the transition out of fossil fuels and Exxon had a $12 trillion number, um, which by the way, both numbers are more than we spent in the last 20 years. Um, and so if you try to imagine a world where oil and gas were outlawed tomorrow, it's, it's not imaginable. So these companies recognize they're in transition industries. And when you integrate ESG into your investment process, instead of specialized specialty ESG, you know, people who say this is bad and this is good, if your oil analyst is the guy or woman, the man or woman that's thinking about um, the sustainability of the business model, the engagement that you have with CEOs of these companies is far more sophisticated. So. For example, we own Halliburton in our portfolios. They're the biggest North American fracking company. That's not a good word. Um, and nevertheless, if you talk to them, they talk about the technology that they've invested in over, over, the, over the past decade to lower the impact of fracking on the environment and to aid in the process of transitioning to a carbon-free world. Now, maybe people will view that as a stretch. We actually view it as a real opportunity to understand and engage with a management team that gets it, is positioning the company accordingly. And because there's so many anti-carbon people out there, giving us the opportunity to buy a stream of cash flows with a responsible management team that's going to generate high returns. And so for us, ESG is an integrated process. We've also done some research, which is preliminary, but it does suggest that companies that improve on their ESG scores tend to outperform. 
and and those that are starting from a low point and engaged in a process of improvement are likely to actually improve. So um, we, we, we think there's a way to actually not abandon being a value investor, but be cognizant of the issues of sustainability on a company's earnings. So the folks will probably notice that the questions are getting much better. It's because I'm just taking them from the audience now. Um, and uh, one of the ones that I, it is an interesting question and it's applied, I'll paraphrase it, but how do you think about innovation? How do you judge innovation within the value cohort of companies? And it's kind of, I think, getting at the whole idea of disruption, right? So being caught in a value trap in another way. And I think in, in many instances, traditional value companies are viewed as bereft of any ability to innovate. And so it's kind of looking at both sides of the coin or each side of the coin, the disruptive side, but actually the proactive side where companies may be doing stuff to improve their lot in life. How have you seen that in your portfolios or how do you think about it as a value investor, Charles? Well, um, you know, really most of these things are outputs of our process. We want uh, efficient capital users. We want uh, to have high returns on tangible capital and all. And, uh, we, you know, we like to have it all. And, and what I can say is now we have a portfolio where, you know, we're getting almost double the free cash flow yield of the S&P. Uh, we probably have um, our definition of value is different than Russell's, but we have about five times the sales growth of uh, the Russell 1000 value uh, year over year. Um, we have about 50% more return on tangible capital. We have positive operating margin trends, positive gross margin trends versus negative for you know the rest of 1000 value. Um, you know, we have less book value for share relative to price, but uh, you know that's not something we look at. That's just an output, and you know there's telltale signs that we always look for. You know, so I, I teach a class on this. You know, look, you want to, and and it, once again, these are outputs. Uh, but if you take a look at, let's say, uh, are we running into a problem? Is this company not doing so well? And so, if you look at, let's say, our inventories and receivables building up relative to sales. In other words, our is sales grow? Our inventory and receivables growing faster? than sales. In fact, uh, it's the opposite for us, meaning our uh, sales is outpacing inventory and receivables build up, whereas in, in, in the indexes, both indexes, the S&P and the Russell 1000, it's the opposite. So if you have better fundamentals uh, from an operating standpoint, nothing price related, and you can get it cheaper, and you're in a business that deploys capital well, and the two types of businesses we like to see, I mean, there's two ways to get a high return on tangible capital. One is you don't need a lot of capital, you're asset light. So you don't need a lot of working capital, you don't need a lot of fixed assets, uh, which means you get to keep most of your earnings, which means you don't have to borrow money because you don't have to spend a lot of money. So that's a virtuous circle there. And the other type of businesses, companies that spend a lot of money and earn a lot of money on that spending. You know, Buffett had a great write up on, you know, uh, his railroad you know, ownership, you know, where, yeah, it takes a lot of money, but his cost of money is low. He can reinvest at much higher rates of return and it's, and it's, it's very predictable. So it's a, and growing. So it's a, it's a, it's a good business. So if you can deploy your capital, well, uh, you know, even better, uh, obviously Buffett would say growth and value are tied at the hip, right? The growth is a component of valuation. And that's the way we look at it. So Rich, you touched a little bit on innovation with your Halliburton example. Maybe if you could flesh out how you avoid value traps uh, and, and maybe touching on the whole idea of disruption. Well, yeah, disruption, it's an interesting concept because it's sort of, people have this idea that there, prior to 10 years ago, there was no technological innovation ever. And it just in the last 10 years, all of a sudden we have a technological revolution. Um, and you heard how Joel and I did our project 40 years ago by flipping through the stock guide. So I promise you five years after that, it would have been a lot easier. And, and that was massive technological innovation. And technology changed. The, 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 the big difference in the market today 
is people believe that the disruptor wins and the incumbent loses, which is not the long-term history, right? If you have a really good franchise and technology evolves, you will be the winner but as long as the franchise is really good because you'll adopt the technology in your own business. I'm gonna use financial services as one of the better examples of that. You know how many FinTech companies have started up and made people very, very rich. What's happened to the share of bank deposits um, over the last 10 years? It's only gotten bigger for the big banks. Why? Because they're the ones who bought all those technology companies and deployed it so that they had a better offering. And because the person that was the innovator of the technology figured out that I don't wanna be regulated by the Fed and try and collect money. I'd rather sell my, my, my Venmo-like product to Chase so that they can offer that to their customers and, and, and incorporate it and therefore strengthen their franchise. So if I, if I have to pay a um, hundred times sales for the innovator or eight times earnings for the one that's going to capitalize on that innovation and strengthen their franchise, that's what I would prefer to do. And we spent a lot of time thinking about is the franchise going to be a winner or a loser with the new technology? And if you can avoid the ones that where, where disruptive technology accrues to the benefit of the new entrant. And it's hard these days because the new entrants get free money. I mean, people just pour money into these things. If you say, I have a business that can um, grow its sales base a lot and has a giant TAM, you used that word before, I can raise, I, can, I get a billion dollar valuation off the hook, off the bat. And it's insane. I mean, it's insane because the people that they're competing against, if you give some, it's easy to grow a business when you give something somebody for free. Very easy. It's hard to disrupt a franchise long term that has customer loyalty and can and can adopt your technology. And so, so you went into financials and there is a follow on question here. And this is just for you, Rich. And I've heard this many times over my career as well. Given the complexity of the banks today and the somewhat cynical comment is the managements don't even really understand the businesses. Uh, and I used to joke when I was at Morgan Stanley, the problem with these enterprises is the people running them were political science or liberal arts majors and all the people creating the products went to Caltech or MIT. So there was this dichotomy between what was being created and who was running them, but just generally on the complexity of financials. I, my guess is you're going to distill it down into something more simple, but that's the question to you. They're not very complex. Basically, you take deposits and you pay somebody interest, you make a loan and you collect interest. And by the way, there's nothing more sophisticated than that. And there's been no innovation in forever. Okay. So, um, I've watched all these, these financial services companies that have tried to do things differently. They're generally front ends to an existing plumbing infrastructure, but banks are not that hard. They're, you can't know exactly what they do, right? Because I can't, I can't study every loan that they make. But if you ever looked at disclosure from a financial services from a bank, their 10Ks are like, 500 pages thick. There's You have more information on a bank than on almost any other kind of investment that you make. So yes, they can get themselves into trouble when, when they go crazy. And we have lots and lots of examples of that over history. Um, when we're in an era where they're not going crazy, which we're clearly in, they're quite simple. Okay, so I have one, we're near the end. I have one specific question for Joel and then one question for both of you and we'll wrap up. The, the question for you, Joel, is given the, a lot of the weaknesses uh, that everyone identifies in the traditional indices that have been created, why hasn't Gotham created their own kind of value indices or looked at creating things along that 
metric that would be a more useful way of representing value? Um, it, it, one thing that I think is important, I guess, and one thing we learned, you know, being involved with uh, particular, well, both retail and, you know, I sit on a lot of investment boards as well. Uh, you know, you sit at a big uh, endowment, you know, which should have a perpetuity of a time frame. Uh, you know, the longest time frame of anybody. And there's still a guy who allocates to U.S. equities or real estate or whatever it is, and they still have a three-year benchmark. And so for better or worse, benchmarking matters. And if you look at all the money flows from mutual funds and retail, basically it follows good returns. The money comes in after good returns, leaves after bad returns and goes in and out at all the wrong times. So what is that what are the wrong times? Well, when you're underperforming a benchmark. So the benchmarks do matter, whichever the ones are that are established. I mean, the best business would be creating terrible benchmarks, then everyone will use them and beat them. That would, that would be a really good business, but I just throw that out. Um, the, uh, but we do something, we, we created something realizing that you know, you're not doing anyone a favor if they don't stay with you over the long term. So different strokes for different folks. So we, we did something that was like an index tilt versus the S&P. We said, look, if we like something, we did the evaluation of all those stocks. We like it, we'll overweight it a little bit more than what's in the S&P index. If we don't like it, we'll underweight it. So we'll buy all 500, but we're over and underweight. So we created uh, actually our first ETF called the G-SPY, uh, you know, Gotham uh, S&P 500 index. And we just overweight and underweight the ones that we like or we don't like. But uh, the idea is low tracking error, but with a value tilt you know, the way we think of value. And over time, uh, you may help the most, uh, you might help, help the most people because they'll stay with you over the long term. So we have the full on value in our large value. And that's, that's a great spot for people because I think, especially now, what a great opportunity. And that's the way we think about investing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of agree. I mean, even I, I gave a speech a couple of years ago and I said, even Warren Buffett says that most people should just index. And he's thinking the S&P 500 index. Uh, and that's because they don't know how to value companies and they'll stay with it over the long term and collect and they won't trade in and out at all the wrong times. And so uh, I agree with that. But, you know, I, I didn't end my speech there. I said, even Warren Buffett said, I said, you know, well, Warren Buffett doesn't index and neither do we. How come? You know, and because I think we have those opportunities. And but and about to that, we created uh, got in a Gotham enhanced S&P 500, which is a mutual fund and G-SPY. And so it's that's how we've and, and I think that fits fits a need in the in the marketplace and, and may make the most money for people who really have to live with those benchmarks as to us creating benchmarks. We're just trying to make money. And uh, so I don't know what benchmark I would create other than creating a portfolio that makes sense to us. Great. So in one minute or less each, how are your portfolios positioned today sectorally? So what are the, where are your largest wagers, Joel? Well, uh, you know, we're underway technology in our large value where uh, consumer discretionary industrials are, are, you know, we're overweight relative to the index there, you know, significantly. And, and those are the two underweights and overweights. Not that we don't like technology uh, or, or like technology, we have exposure there. It's just that we just bottoms up, create something, and that's where it's leading us. Uh, we did do a lot of work research over you know, a 30 year period looking, do we make money uh, if you overweighted in a sector or industry group that is overweighted in our portfolio at the time and bought an ETF just in that industry group or whatever, did you make money? And it turned out you didn't. Uh, it turned out that all our alpha was idiosyncratic individual stock picking. So it, at least for what we do, not helpful uh, to uh, say, oh, we're overweight in this industry. Let's go buy the ETF in that industry because it must be cheap. It really has to, it's a bottoms up process that ends up where it ends up. We have obviously constraints and uh, to keep us, you know, in the right beta range. And, you know, we don't want to get too skewed. Uh, in, in one area or another. So there are limits, but the general idea is that we're bottoms up uh, picking because that's where all our alpha comes from. And Rich, I know you guys are profoundly bottoms up, but where has that led you to sector? We're, we're, we're almost all cyclical, broadly speaking. So that includes financial services, energy, industrial cyclicals, consumer discretionary, um, and very little 
in in consumer staples and utilities and real estate. Um, it's it's uh, it's interesting. We're in an economic recovery, and earnings are depressed. So when you look at the two-year growth rates from this point forward, our portfolios have um, something like 25% compound growth rates in earnings compared to the Russell 1000 growth index, which is like 17. And we're buying it at less than half the PE on those 20, um, earning, on 2022 earnings. So it's interesting in economic recoveries, value and momentum are the same things. Yeah. And what, that's what we've just seen every cycle, the momentum people and the value people buy the same stocks. And that's what gives you a powerful value cycle. Well, look, this has been terrific. I've been asked to remind everyone that there will be a playback. Uh, and then also, I think we got to virtually all the questions, but if your question wasn't answered, please reach out to your Gotham contact or, or your Pizina contact. And we, we genuinely appreciate your time and hopefully we answered some of your questions. And Joel and Rich, thank you very much for your time. Steve, thank you, Steve. for doing this. This was great. Thank you. Great job.